Well, thank you very much, Skip. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, recognize some of you here from uh, prior uh, experience. Normally, I speak to groups of uh, people that are involved directly in, in raising funds for nonprofits and, uh, and the issues that, that, are, that are facing them in their role. And today, uh, here, I'm cognizant of the fact that many of the people here are students and are pursuing roles in possible uh, public service in the nonprofit and government sector. So what I want to do today is talk about the trends in philanthropy and the state of charitable giving today, but what I want to first do is start at maybe a 30, 40,000 foot level, look at kind of generally what is the role of philanthropy and voluntary funding and volunteerism in our society, how is it shifting and how is it being impacted by economic policies, by uh, demographic shifts, and then by uh, public policy, specifically tax policy, which is in effect a distillation of a lot of different forces in society that are being reflected in government policy, including the tax policy. So that's what we want to do today. And so I'll start with um, just an overview of what we're going to be looking at. I want to look at the role of, of charitable giving in our society. I want to look at the trends that we've seen in the last few years, which uh, have been interesting to us, uh, the challenges that are shaping those trends, and a little bit of the historical perspective that we're dealing with, and then at the end, kind of where do we see this going, and uh, where do we see the future of philanthropy and private funding. All right, I want to start with, with there's four basic sectors that we deal with in society, and I think a lot of people go through undergraduate and maybe graduate programs, and they go out into the world and they don't really stop to think about what are the sectors that are really forming our policies and our culture, what is driving it, and uh, how, do, how do they fit together. We have government programs, a role of government in our society. We have a business sector. We have nonprofits. Now, those are the three primary drivers of our society, our economy. We also have the press, which in a sense serves as an oversight capacity and monitors how these three sectors are working together. And are they being effective? They are, the, in effect, the watchdog overseeing the process. Now, the, the interaction of these, of, these, of these particular forces in our society are driving pretty much everything we're dealing with today. Let's take healthcare, for example. Is healthcare a government function? Yes, we have government-funded health care. Or is it a business? We have for-profit businesses in health care. Or is it nonprofits? We have nonprofit uh, providers. Of, and we have all three of them. And we have complex relationships between government, business, and nonprofit in health care, in religion, in, cult in cultural institutions, etc. All right, what is the role of government in its purest sense? That depends on your perspective. Some people would say the role of government should be very narrow. Some people say it should be broad. In some societies, government controls basically the entire, the entire culture. Most people would agree, though, that at its core, the military, the courts, some other uh, necessities are things that should be provided by the government. That, that last point, of the other public necessities, that's where a lot of the debate is. Most people would not argue that the military and the courts should be done by government and funded by taxes, but a lot of other things there is open for, uh, for question. Now, in the government area, everybody gets one vote. You go and you vote for your legislatures or your president or whoever the, the, the election is for. Each person gets one vote. Now, business. What is the role of business? Well, provides a lot of goods and services. People also vote with their dollars in, in the business sector. You're going to buy an automobile or a, a pair of shoes or whatever, different companies will, will put products out there and in effect, you vote. They try to convince you that their product is going to be the best product for what you need. You're going to be uh, asked by any number of people to buy their products. We have the best this or that. The press plays a role. You, you want to know which is, I bought a cell phone recently. I wasn't sure which cell phone to buy, so I go and signed up for consumer reports for a one-month 
How many of you have done that? Just for one product, right? $7.95, and then you try to cancel. It takes you three hours to cancel. You might as well have subscribed for the whole year by the time you figure out where you have to go. Uh, those free trials are not free often. Uh, so the role of the press there. But most people would agree that at the at basic core, businesses, you want some chewing gum or you know, a soda or whatever, a business is going to do that. You want entertainment, you want luxury goods, that's going to be provided by, by, by businesses. The governments are not going to do that and nonprofits are not going to. All right, different societies though m mix up government and business. In this country, planes are built by Boeing and private companies. You go to Europe, we compete with Airbus, which is a consortium of the British and the French governments who are very much involved in the aerospace industry. Government takes a greater role in a lot of societies in education, in health care, uh, public utilities, transportation, uh, all sorts of other things that government does in other parts of the world that maybe in this country we do uh, by private businesses. Now, so we've got government and we've got business. Now what is this non what's the role of the nonprofit sector and how is it funded? When we decided at the beginning of this country that we were going to have a separation of church and state, that pretty much guaranteed that we would have a nonprofit sector. In Europe, the Church of England, we, we came, the settlers of this country came from an environment where the government and the church was often the same thing and funded by, by government resources. We decided, no, we're going to have freedom of religion, which means the government's not paying for it, so you better go out and raise the money. So fundraising really started in this country, and the nonprofit sector started at the core of religion. We all agreed that, that businesses and government should not be running religious organizations. Now, other types of nonprofits, other functions are continually being debated. Should social services be done by nonprofits, or should it be done by the government? Uh, should education? Healthcare. This is at the very core of all of the debates that we're seeing now. It's really what is the role of government, what is the role of business, and what is the role of nonprofits. And the healthcare debate is going to be continually focusing us and our attention on uh, that particular <clears throat> tension that has existed. Cultural institutions, same thing. Should governments support the arts? Should businesses run the arts? Who should be providing the arts? All right, the nonprofit sector as we know it in this country doesn't exist in a lot of parts of the world, uh, especially when you're looking at, at totalitarian types of governments, whether you're talking about the left, uh, communist systems, or on the right. Uh, when you, I was reading something recently about philanthropy in Nazi Germany. Uh, one of the first things that the Nazi party did when they came to power was take over the equivalent of the German Red Cross and the Widows and Relief Orphans Funds. And when you got on a bus in Berlin in the 1930s, you would put your coins in the slot and then the conductor would hold the can out and you would be expected to also give money. Was that voluntary philanthropy? No. It was, but it was, it was philanthropy in the sense that it was funding the nonprofit sector, but it was more of a coerced tax, if you will, that, that was collected by the bus drivers when you got on the, on the bus. Now, this is something, just to divert a bit here, Plato's laws, Plato understood the importance of government controlling culture. This is, he was talking about how Greek society had devolved, and he blamed it on, on freedom in the cultural area and not being controlled. They were men of genius, but they had no perception of what was just and lawful in music. And by composing licentious works and adding them, them words as licentious, they have expired the multitude with lawlessness and boldness and made them fancy that they could judge for themselves about melody and song. In music, there first arose the universal conceit of omniscience and general lawlessness. Freedom came following afterwards, and men, fancying that they knew what they did not know, had no longer any fear, and the absence of fear begets shamelessness. For what is this shamelessness, which is so evil a thing, but the insolent refusal to regard the opinion of the better by reason of an overdaring sort of liberty? What he was saying is that you better control music, you better control the arts if you, if you want to keep society from in, in control. So that's why in, in totalitarian governments you don't have a nonprofit sector. You don't have, it's an integral part of our freedom and our democracy. All right, the nonprofit sector, how is it funded? Well, lots of different ways. Universities, uh, symphonies, 
uh, museums, many of them have fees. If you go into the museum or, or you, you enroll in a college, even if it's nonprofit, a private college, you're going to pay fees. You go to the, to the museum, bookstore, or whatever, they're selling products there. So there's a lot of different sources of revenue, grants from, from public sources, government grants, but in a, mostly private individuals are the source of a lot of the funding for the nonprofit sector. Fundraising is in a sense equivalent to sales in the for-profit area where you're out soliciting people to vote with their, their dollars. When you're raising money, you're going to somebody and saying, I have a product that I want to sell you in effect. This is what we do. This is how we enrich, enrich society. Would you be willing to vote with your dollars? Would you be willing to invest in what we do? So in a sense, that, that is the equivalent in the nonprofit sector to sales and marketing is the fundraising wall. Soliciting votes, if you will. A little bit different from political fundraising, but it's similar in some respects. Now, unlike the for-profit sector where people, can, I'm sorry, the, the government sector where you get one vote, in the nonprofit world, people that have more money, in effect, have more votes. And this is where we're getting into the core of some of the public policy issues now. And, and in the tax policy, was the question is, should, should tax policy be subsidizing the votes? You see a lot of the controversy about the charitable deduction saying, well, the rich are benefiting more from their deductions than other people. The rich, is, the rich their philanthropy is being subsidized more than everybody else. We're going to look at that in a few minutes. But I wanted to bring this up on the front end so just to set some perspective as to how this all fits together. There's lots of ways to raise money for nonprofits. Some of them are mass oriented. Some of them are focused. Well, let's sit, uh, go back to Franklin Roosevelt. During the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt had polio and he wanted to start the Warm Springs Rehabilitation Center to, to fight uh, polio and look for treatments and cures. So he decided he wanted to raise some money, so he brought in some fundraising experts at the time and they said, you know, we ought to be able to find a small number of people who would be willing to give us a lot of money and we can get this done quickly. The consultant told him, you know, in this environment, you're going you're to do a lot better getting 100,000 people to give 10 cents than you are to get a few people to give $100,000. So that's how the March of Dimes was born. It was the idea of mass-based fundraising, 10 cents at a time. On the other hand, you have major campaigns now that you read about for a billion dollars or more, and you'll find that maybe 800 million of that money comes from maybe four, five, six sources. So we have mass-based fundraising, and we have fundraising that's focused on, on, on the wealthy. Charities of all sorts, nonprofits of all sorts, they have to produce money to run current operations, to pay the utility bills, to pay for salaries for people to do the work. They have to have buildings. They have to raise money occasionally for capital purposes. And then if they're going to be sustainable over time, if you're going to have scholarship funds or you're going to have a research fund or you're going to make grants for particular things, you need endowment and you need the ability to sustain yourself uh, over time. Now, individuals, where does the money come from to meet these needs? The focus on tax policy is important, and the focus on how we treat charitable giving from a tax policy standpoint is important because every year approximately 80 to 81 percent of the nonprofit funding in this country comes from individuals. Foundations provide about 14 percent of the funding, corporations about 5 percent. You see a lot of focus on corporate and foundation fundraising. But year after year, 80% of it comes from individuals who are making gifts during their lifetime or as part of their uh, estates. So the role of, of, of fundraising is, in effect, to get people to give something out of their current income, primarily for current operations, give out of assets when it comes time for capital needs, and the bulk of endowments and the long-term sustainability comes from people that leave funds from their estates. So what we're trying to do here in the, in the broader perspective is to match the needs of the institutions with the ways that people uh, have to give from income and from their assets and their estates. Nothing new about any of this. I want to go back here for a second to some 20, over 2,000 years ago. Aristotle wrote extensively about philanthropy in ancient Greece. 
He wrote about people who would only give for recognition. He wrote about people that would only give anonymously. But he was very concerned that this was an integral part of, of funding the culture in a free and democratic society. He made this point though, to give away money is an easy matter and in anyone's power, but to decide to whom to give it, how much to give, when to give, and to give for the right reason, to give, to give for the right motive and in the right way, is neither in everyone's power nor an easy matter. Hence it is that such excellence is, ra is rare, praiseworthy, and noble. So 2,000 years ago, Aristotle was, was struggling with some of the same issues as what should I support? Why should I do it? How much should we give? When should we give it and how? So I've, in my career, I have adapted basically Aristotle's quote there and basically broken every gift into five parts. Who makes the gift? Individuals, corporations, foundations. Why do they make it? I'm gonna stop here for a second. There are lots of reasons that people make charitable gifts. We're focusing on some tax policy here today, but that's the least important of the motivators. The primary reason that most philanthropy is motivated historically through religious motivations. Every religious tradition in the history of mankind that I'm aware of has taught the importance of philanthropy and the voluntary giving and support of, of others and others' needs. So we have religion as a motivator. Other people who are not necessarily religious, they give out a social theory, social, noblesse oblige. This is something that we do. It's something that, that is necessary. I'm privileged in society, so I have a duty to give something back. Other people give out a political theory. As I understand it in reading some of the thoughts of Bill Gates and others on this subject, uh, Bill Gates is not a believer in vast amounts of hereditary wealth. He believes that people should be allowed to make money and accumulate assets, but he does not believe in hereditary uh, wealth in, in major proportions. He thinks that it needs to be reinvested in society, that it's an integral part of a, of a free democratic society that, 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 that funds keep circulating through society and they not be concentrated uh, in hereditary uh, wealth. So that's, that's, that has nothing to do with religion. That's, that's a political, social theory. Other people give out of emotion. Let's suppose that, that you had a, a, a good friend's child that you were close to uh, was affected by a serious illness and, and died at eight years old from, from a disease. That, it, that would make you angry, it would make you sad, it would, it would evoke a lot of emotions, all of which might motivate you to decide to voluntarily invest some of your assets or your funds in, with some organization or institution that's fighting that. It has nothing to do with your tax deductions or your religion or anything else. It's about, it's about, human, it's about human needs and human emotions. Uh, one of the things that people do in this area, especially when they get into more of the mechanics of gifts, is to focus too much on making it a rational process. Uh, I love this quote, the heart has reasons which reason knows, knows not of. How many of you saw the movie, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I love that movie, I memorized most of it. One of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, when, when they were asking Everett, well, let's vote on this. And they, all, they each voted and Everett goes, well, I guess I win, because I'm voting for me. He goes, well, who put, that doesn't make any sense. And then he looks at him and goes, it's a fool who looks for logic in the chambers of the human heart. <laughs> this is not logical activity we're talking about here. A lot of it is emotionally driven. All right, the tax and economic benefits, which is where we're gonna focus most of the rest of our time here, are not the primary motivator of gifts. No matter what you read about your tax deductible contribution, you know, not the primary reason that people are making these gifts. Every situation that I've ever dealt with has been a combination of one or more of these various motivators that we've looked at that are combining in lots of different, uh, different ways. So from a fundraising perspective, I want to know as much about a person's uh, religion, their social, their, their political theory, uh, what drives them emotionally. Those are as important to me as the property that they give and the tax consequences. Those are important, but they're the icing on the cake. The cake is found in the other circles. Every gift I've ever dealt with, there might have been a primary motivator, whether it's religion or emotions or social theory, politics or some combination, 
Rarely are the tax and economic benefits the primary motivator. To have them is important, not as a motivator, but not to have them is a demotivator. And that's where we need to focus our attention from a policy standpoint now is not that it's not social engineering. Tax deductions are not there necessarily to promote giving or to, to subsidize giving. They're to recognize the fact that we should not necessarily tax funds that have been voluntarily redistributed to others that have been voluntarily foregone. That's not the same as mortgage interest. It's not the same as, as, as someone buying a bigger house and have a bigger mortgage and being subsidized by being able to deduct that from taxes. When people are giving money voluntarily for things that are societal needs, the question is, should we, put, should we raise taxes in our country by targeting that? And that's where we're going to focus our attention. Not so much on who and why, but we want to look at what people give, when do they give it, and then how is the gift structured. That's the area where tax and economics are more uh, important. All right, what are the trends in giving that we're seeing now against that background? We've seen the worst decline in charitable giving in the last few years that we've seen since the Depression. There was a 15% decline between 2007 and 2009. This is, again, the steepest declines. You have to go back to 1931-32 to find drops of that magnitude. This is the overall trend from 1990 through 2009, and you can see that was a, a, a fairly significant drop there. Uh, good news is there were increases in 2010 and 11. But adjusted, we're not even in real terms back to 2007 levels. And adjusted for inflation, it's been estimated it'll be 2016 or 18 before we get back to adjusted, inflation adjusted 2007 giving. So we're looking at a lost decade of 10 years where there's been no, there's been declines. In fact, no increases. We'll be lucky to get back where we were by 2016, 17, 18. Uh, this has been driven partly by economic conditions in our society, by population shifts, which are just as important for the future of philanthropy, uh, e economic, po politics, and then, uh, as alluded to, the political issues related to taxes and some of the other uh, government perspectives. All right, all of these issues, the economy, the demographic shifts and political considerations, they're all related in ways that I want to kind of focus on uh, for a minute and look at how we can challenge, how these challenges can be met as we go along. All right, the biggest issue underlying the decline in giving was what happened in, in the stock market between 2007 and 2009. This is a nice chart that shows a dip there and a recovery to where we are today, close to 15,000. But the reality was that by March of 2009, the Dow had lost half of its value. And we're still recovering from that and the psychological impact on donors from that. So the wealthy, the large gifts have been impacted more by, by economic declines and the, and the slow recovery. We're also seeing another issue which I'm, I'm encountering especially with organizations that rely on large numbers of older donors, people that are retired, that are living on fixed incomes. When you have interest rates hovering around 1% or below, people that used to be uh, earning 5, 6, 7, 8% on their savings are down to 1% or less. This is having a negative impact on dis discretionary income, especially among uh, older individuals. Now, Turning to the, to the combination of economics and tax policy, uh, the, the big decline in giving in this country, this big drop, was not driven by the masses of people giving 10 cents or a dollar at a time. Just as in the Depression, what we've seen is mass-based philanthropy and the smaller donors, the $25, $50 gifts, those have continued pretty much un uninterrupted. The big drop in giving in this country, $31 billion, was concentrated in people with incomes over 200,000. About 87% of the decline in giving was in the individuals over 200,000. Now that's important because the proposed cuts in tax benefits for philanthropy are being focused directly at that group of people, the ones who, who already declined, de decreased their giving the most during the recession period. Uh, 
Now, there was some recovery in giving in 2010, and it was led by people with incomes uh, over 200,000. If you see, for incomes under 200,000 only increased by 2%. Most of the increase, most of the recovery, was in a 17% increase in giving by people over $200,000. So again, this, this problem period that we've come through in philanthropy has been mainly focused at the top among the major donor uh, group. We have yet to see anywhere near normal giving among that group. We've not seen a recovery there yet. Chronicle Philanthropy, this is from last June. They were making the point that the million dollar plus gifts were on a decline. They declined again in 2012 and they'd already declined dramatically. This is the number of gifts reported in America, according to the Chronicle Philanthropy, over a million dollars dropped from 753 to 364 over a three-year period. That's a 50% drop in numbers. In terms of dollars in the million dollar up category, it dropped uh, over 80%. Again, we haven't seen anything like that since the Depression. What we see here is a, is a depiction of the dollars that came from the larger gifts between 2007 and 11. Here's what happened between 1931 and 1941. Same sort of precipitous drop at the beginning of the Depression among the largest gifts and then a flattening while we re gradually recovered over a 10-year period. By the mid-40s and early 50s, that had recovered. So we're looking perhaps at a fairly long period before we see a recovery in some of the primary sources of funding for nonprofits. Now, looking to the political side of this, which to a large extent is driven by the economy, uh, this deficit, you can't pick up a newspaper or turn on a radio or watch television without hearing about what are we doing about the deficit. Are we going to spend less? Are we going to tax people more? Are we going to do neither and just let the current trend continue and the gaps widen? Or are we going to do both spend less and tax more? Probably some variation of the latter will be what we end up uh, doing at the end. Now, to some extent, the deficit has been driven. Tax receipts fall along with economic conditions declining. You have fewer taxes being collected. Demographics, though, are having a big impact on our economy, our tax policy, and on philanthropy, as we'll see in a minute. This is the birth rate in America between 1909 and 1990. Prior to the, to the Depression, America was primarily an agrarian-based society. You had large farm families, high birth rates, around three million people a year being born. The Depression came along, urbanization, industrial, greater industrialization. Lots of factors converged to drive down the birth rate by about 23% during the period from 1925 to 1935. Then we saw a long 20-year upward trend from the mid-30s until the mid to late 1950s, where we had a huge increase in numbers of people being born. And then around 1960, 61, you had a, 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 a lot of other things happening in our society that drove, that drove the birth rates down again. Now, who cares? What difference does this make? Well, if you look at the ages of these people today, this is what we're dealing with. I think every session of Congress should open with this chart. We have 70 million people going past the age of 75 over the next 20 years, and there's not enough people coming behind them to pay taxes, to pay for entitlement programs, to give to charity, to provide a lot of social services. This is, defines our entire society at this point, the aging of the population. And I think it's not dealt with and addressed enough because it is so baked in and there's absolutely nothing we can do about this except deal with immigration policy. And we have to have a lot more people in this country to fill that hole and they have to be people that are working and paying taxes and supporting nonprofit sector and, and all the other things that the people who were not born uh, during that period of time following the, the baby boom uh, so basically this age wave, uh, whatever, this affects everything. It certainly affects charities because the primary giving period for most individuals is between the ages of 55 and 65, and the first baby boomers are turning 66, 67, and we're now seeing 
a, a group of donors kind of moving out of the scene from an active participation, and there are not enough people coming behind them, and they're, and they're loaded with, with debt and student loans and a whole lot of things that the baby boomers didn't have. So again, this is driving a lot of the deficits. Uh, this is the people that are alive today as of 2010. This is what it's going to look like in 2020. You're actually going to have fewer people alive in 2020 in, in the 45 to 60 age range, and you're going to have more people. The growth in the population is in the 65 plus group. In fact, for the 10 years of this decade, the number of people over 65 is growing 35 percent, and impact on tax policy, there's impact on philanthropy, on business, all the different sectors. Baby boomers are being told that they have a very, a very high, uh, a high likelihood of living to be 100 years old. Used to be people would say, oh, 70 years old, the baby boomers, a number of you in this room are baby boomers, I can tell, and why, well, when, we were, when we were in our 20s, I mean, 70 years old seemed ancient, right? Well, happy, <laughs> happy birthday, Paul McCartney, age 70, right? And then Bob Dylan, 71 years old. And then we have our old friend, Mick, Mick Jagger turned 70 this year. So, uh, for those of us from the baby boom generation, this is uh, got to be... Now, this is a friend of mine's mother who was on the beach in, in uh, Hawaii, and a uh, beautiful, beautiful woman, uh, 94 years old. So, welcome to the future, all right? Uh, is 100 the new, <laughs> the, new, the new 80, right? This woman's 102 years old, the oldest Facebook user. So one of the major trends in philanthropy and charitable giving is that a 70-year-old donor is a baby with 20 to 25 years of active ahead of them. And that's where a lot of the future of philanthropy is going to be. This is from the top 50 donors in 2011. The average age was, the median age was 74, and 60% of them were over the age of 70, and 41% over the age of 80. These are the people that made average gifts of $40 million or more. So we're talking about uh, an aging of the population, aging of the donor base. All right, so this is going to reduce tax revenues. It's going to increase spending, which is another reason that a lot of the discussions that we're dealing with now are turning to entitlement reform, because people are realizing that this age wave and this aging thing is real, and that it's a, it's a pressure on spending, and it's a reduction of income. I'm worried that over the long haul, that policies in the, in the entitlement area could have an impact on philanthropy as people are spending their money on uh, perhaps more and more on health care and other things. All right, so that brings us to the current policy debates over uh, tax policy and the, the deficit reduction. Uh, again, are we going to reduce spending? Are we going to raise taxes? Or are we going to do neither or both? How can we do both? Well, we reduce tax expenditures. We raise the tax rates earlier this year. Now, the way that we raise more money is by cutting the tax expenditures. What's that? Those are deductions or loopholes, all right? If you do that, you don't really have to cut spending and you don't really have to increase tax rates, but you are increasing taxes. You're, you're just targeting that tax increase to people that have been benefiting from particular deductions in the past. Uh, so now we're looking at ways to, that impact charitable giving indirectly. They didn't do anything to cut the charitable deduction or change it into really to any degree in the taxes, the tax changes that happened in January, but we're beginning to see calls for broadening the tax base and raising taxes by reducing the tax benefits associated with charitable giving. Now, there's nothing new about this debate. Any of you know what this is? The Rosetta Stone? Do you know what that was? It was the tax-exempt document for the temples. If you translate it, 
No, in four languages they were saying, you can't tax the temples because the gods have been good to Egypt. So again, it was the tax, it was the tax exemption certificate for the temple where it was found. This is from Genesis, and Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. The fifth part, 20%. This was a 20% flat tax with a charitable deduction. That's basically where we seem to be moving now is a flatter tax code. They settled on 20%, but not taxing the land of the, of the pharaohs. Our current system was established in 1913. The first deductions were the charitable deduction that came in in 1917. The purpose of the deduction, and this is the announcement of it in New York Times, the purpose of the charitable deduction was not to encourage charitable giving. It was to acknowledge the fact that if they put high taxes in place and raise taxes on the wealthy to pay for World War I, that they would be taxing away money at the margin that would have been given to charity in the past. So they said, we need to carve out a certain amount of money that people can give to charity each year so that we're not taking away in taxes money that's used to fund the Red Cross and other, and other uh, functions that were at the, at the time. All right, so is the charitable deduction one of these tax expenditures like mortgage interest and many of the other things that we should treat as loopholes or is it something that is more important than that? Our current system is some kind of a hybrid between uh, encouraging giving and addressing the fact that, you're, that we shouldn't be taxing dollars that are given to charity. Now, how does this system work? Does it, does it subsidize people? Does it, is it a free ride when you give money to charity? Is it a write-off? I don't like the term write-off because it makes it sound like that you're not paying tax on that money that's, that's being given away. Well, you're not, but it's not a free ride. Charitable gifts do not reduce your tax bill dollar for dollar. If a person has an income of $75,000 and they decide to give $1,000 to charity, Let's say their tax bill would have been $10,000 and they gave $1,000 to charity. Do they get to then reduce their tax bill by $1,000? No, that would be a tax credit. We do not have a tax credit system. We have a tax deduction system. What determines the cost of your gift is the amount of your tax rate. Now, this is why they say that the wealthy benefit more. If you're in a 39% in a, a tax bracket and you give a dollar away, if you had kept that dollar and paid tax on it, how much would you have left? 60 cents. So what did it cost you to give the money to charity? A dollar? No. It cost you the 60 cents you would have had if you kept it. So this is why it, 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 you don't give away a dollar to save 39 cents, right? It costs you 60 cents on the dollar to give money to charity. If you're in a 15% tax bracket, right, it costs you 85 cents because you would have kept 85 cents had you, not, had you not given it away. So the argument is that people in higher tax brackets are subsidized more. But the reason is because they pay higher taxes if they keep the money. It's not because of, of any, any in, intention of subsidizing their giving more. It's that it costs them more if they don't make the, if, sorry, if they, if they can't deduct it, it costs them more. So there's more of a disincentive for people who are wealthy to make, if you, if you take away the tax deductions. Now, how would that work exactly? Well, let's suppose that, that, that this gift is deductible and the person gives $1,000. They're going to save 39.6% in taxes or $396. The after-tax cost of that gift is $604. How much money did it take Richard to make this gift though? $1,000 worth of income. That's the important thing to watch. Watch the cash required because that's the key to understanding the issues that come up with the proposed tax changes. Now let's suppose Richard's gift is not deductible. Now he's got a tax bill of $10,000. He gives $1,000 to charity. The tax rate is 39.6% but he, he has to pay tax, not only on the $1,000 he gave away, he has to now earn $1,656, pay tax on that to net the $1,000 he gave to charity. So that's a 65% increase in the amount of, of assets that it takes to make that gift. 
That's what people are worried about. It's not so much the subsidy, it's the, it's the desubsidy, if you will. It's what it costs, you're raising the cost, you, rise, you raise the cost of a, of a, of a uh, product from $1,000 to $1,600 in out-of-pocket costs. You're gonna see some decline in demand for that. So what would Richard have to do to keep his out-of-pocket, his cash cost at $1,000? he'd have to reduce his gift by about 40% to $600 because he has to pay tax on the $1,000. So to keep his out-of-pocket cost the same, the $1,000 he has to earn, this is what he would have to do. All right, so again, there's a lot of controversy here. This is an op-ed piece that I wrote last year uh, about this issue, basically pointing out the fact that the people that are that have reduced their giving the most, the ones that, that had declined the 200,000 and up, that's the group of people that would be hit the hardest by changes. Here's what, here's what would happen in the different tax brackets if we didn't have a charitable deduction. The amount of cash required to make the gift, even in the 15% bracket, it would be an 18% increase all the way up to 66% in a $10,000, uh, I'm sorry, in a 39.6% bracket. All right, it boils down to this. Every dollar that you earn or comes into your possession in whatever way, you pay taxes on it for part of it. You're gonna spend what's left after taxes, part of it. You're gonna save part of it, hopefully. And you're gonna give some of it to other people, whether you give it, to, whether you give it for charitable purposes or whether you give it to family or friends or whatever. Just the tax increases that happened at the beginning of this year from the wealthy that is already taking more funds out of pocket that leaves less for spending, saving, and giving. So we already have put a negative pressure on, on disposable income to then tax those dollars in full or part, uh, I don't think is a wise uh, policy. Now, what the, the plan that's on the table now the, in the administration budget, what they would do would be limit the charitable deduction and all itemized deductions to 28%. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that you should only benefit to 28%, and the wealthy who are paying 39% or 35 or 36 in taxes, they shouldn't benefit more than people that are paying 28%. That's, that's the way it's being described by the proponents of this. Actually, what this is, it's a targeted tax increase that's aimed only at the most generous people among our society. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether it's mortgage interest or property taxes or charitable. They're treating them all, all the same. Primarily affects those people who were the largest decline in, in giving uh, was. Again, the argument is the rich should not get a larger subsidy. In reality, it's a, it's a tax increase. How would this work? Now, let's suppose you make a $10,000 gift and you're in, and you're in a 39.6% bracket. You're allowed to deduct the gift, but only up to the 28% bracket. What it means is any tax rate over 28%, you pay that tax on the amount that you gave away. So in this case, it would require $11,312 worth of income to make the gift that used to cost $10,000 to make. Now, what a person would do to keep the out-of-pocket cost the same here would be reduce the gift to maybe $8,900 because they have to hold back the money to pay the tax on that. So again, this is a targeted tax increase as part of the ways to raising money. Again, depending on what bracket you're in, over 28%, you see there's an impact of anywhere from 3% to 13% increase in the cost. So imagine that, that there was a sales tax of 13% put on all charitable gifts by the wealthy, because that's in effect what this is, would be. It's like, okay, you've made your $1,000 gift, but now you owe a, a, a sales tax or, or a charity uh, tax of $1,130 or whatever it is, depending on your tax bracket. All right, one of the things that has been proposed and I think is probably a likely outcome would be to treat the charitable deduction differently from mortgages and other deductions. Let the cap go in so people that have million dollar mortgages, they maybe can't deduct all of that mortgage interest, uh, but not apply this to the charitable deduction. This would probably be the best case for uh, philanthropy in this country. It's very similar to the treatment we now have for the alternative minimum tax. 
where when you, when you get to a certain point where your taxes are lowered, you have to go back and refigure your taxes under the alternative system. Nothing is deductible, your mortgage, well, there, there's some things that are deductible, but your mortgage is not deductible, property taxes, but charitable gifts are deductible against the 28% alternative minimum tax bracket. So I think this is probably the best alternative and the best outcome. Limit the benefits from some of the deductions that are more personal, like your mortgage and things that benefit you, but not limit the ones that benefit society. Another area that we need to look to for the future is in the area of the estate taxes. Now, why do we care about this? Because with this aging population, increasingly charities, nonprofits of all sorts are going to have to rely more and more on a gift from estates and from people that, that give when they pass away. It's already a very large source of funding, but it's going to grow as the population gets older. They've raised the amount that can be left by an individual to $5 million. That was $675,000 as recently as 1999-2000. So this is a very big reduction in the effective estate tax. Now it's adjusted for inflation, so the amount for 2013 is 5.2 million, or for a couple it's $10.5 million. Now if you think that people leave money to charity in their wills to avoid estate taxes, you might as well just give up on any estate gifts because what this means is very, very few people are going to be affected by the estate tax from this point on. Let's see what this means exactly. This is from last year. Out of 2.5 million people who died last year, only 800 would have taxable estates under this current system. This means out of these 2.5 million who died, according to the Center for Disease Control, only 800 of those 2.5 million will have any estate tax liability. And what that amounts to is the estate tax, the federal estate tax is gone now for 99.88% of the general population. So to the extent that charitable gifts at death are motivated by estate taxes, that's gone, right? at a time when the population is getting older and we're also looking at tax and putting heavier taxes and an excise tax, if you will, on charitable gifts by wealthier individuals during their lifetime. So we've got kind of a little perfect storm brewing here. Good news here, very good news, this is kind of the opposite of the income tax picture. What would happen if, if we totally eliminated the estate tax? Well, we've pretty much done it, so let's look and see what what the wealthy tell us about that. The studies that have been done show that most people would not affect their planned bequests from their estates without any estate tax. In fact, they might very well increase them. This is a study that was done by the uh, Partnership for Philanthropic Planning, PPP, it was done in 2002. 97% of the people said they were leaving money to charity out of desire to support the charity. Only about 30% said taxes had anything to do with it. There's another studies that have been done the last few years by Bank of America, where they studied just high net worth individuals, and they asked them if there was no estate tax, what would you do? The vast majority, 90% said they would leave their, estate, their bequests the same or they would even increase them. And about 10%, 14% uh, said they would dramatically increase them. Well, wh why is that? People tend to decide how much they want their family members to receive at their death. They pay the tax on that and they leave the rest to charity. This is a study done by Bankers Trust in 2000 before they began lowering the, the tax rates. They asked people, what would you do if you didn't have to pay a state tax? They said, well, we'd leave more to our family and we would leave more to, 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 uh, to charity. And of the 37% that they felt they would be paying in taxes, they would increase their children and grandchildren from 42 to 58 percent, and they would increase charity from 16 percent of their estate to 26 percent. So again, all the surveys, all the studies show that wealthy individuals without an estate tax will tend to leave more to, uh, to charity than they would before. Example of this, let's suppose you've got a person with a $10 million estate. They had decided they wanted to leave 10% of their estate to charity. A million dollars, they made a commitment to a particular charitable interest for a million dollars. What happens if you eliminate the estate tax? 
Well, if you go back to 2009, under the prior system, they would have owed two and a half million dollars in tax on the 10 million. A million would have gone to charity. The children would have gotten 10 million minus the million dollar bequest minus the taxes, or 6.5 million dollars. With no estate tax, the state still 10 million dollars. The charity still gets a million dollars, and the amount taxable though is zero. The amount paid in tax is zero. The children get nine million instead of six and a half million, or 90 percent of the estate. If a person had already decided to leave money to charity under the other system, depriving their children of that million, why would they change that when the children are going to get more now? So in effect, what that person could do is you could double the bequest. You could make the amount to charity go from a million to two million dollars, and the children would still get eight million instead of 6.5, and the, the children would get 80 percent of the estate instead of 65. This is why when they survey the wealthy and they say, with no estate tax, would you cut charity out, they say no. Because most people, again, decide how much they want their children and nieces and nephews or whoever to have. They pay the tax on that, and then the rest they leave to charity. That would not change. There's actually more disposable assets in, in the estate in that situation. So started here with a broad overview of the, of the general role of philanthropy in the nonprofit sector. We've looked at some of the, uh, the issues related to the economy, to the demographics, and how those have been driving tax policy and how they're all uh, interrelated. I think it, as a conclusion of this, I think that we're going to have to rely in the future probably more and more on older individuals to support philanthropic efforts in our society. I think as the baby boomers are, are retiring and beginning to reflect on their lives and, and what's, how they've spent their lives and how they've earned their money and going back to the way things were when they were younger and in college, I think a lot of baby boomers in their 60s and 70s are going to be putting their money where their mouth was back in, in, in the 60s when they, were, when they had strong beliefs and no money. Now they, many of them have money, and now they've got, they've got some votes now. So for those of us who are planning careers in public service or are already pursuing those careers, I think the key is to believe in what it is that you're doing, believe that it's something that's, that's worthy of, of funding, and then find the people that share those beliefs and help those people voluntarily redistribute part of their income, their assets, or their estates. How many people in this room, how many of you support one or more charitable organizations? How many of you have ever wanted to make a gift larger than the gift you ended up making? Well, I think everybody in the room raised their hands, and I think we need to look at our society that way. We have people who, who want to pay their taxes, they want to support public public activities and things that are governmental. But many people have other passions and other things that they believe in that they want to support. And sure, they'll give without tax incentives, but I don't think now is the time to be introducing new penalties or taxes on money that's being voluntarily given to, to meet those passions in, in a time uh, when it's difficult for many people to do so. So that's, that can, is the end of my uh, prepared remarks. I'm just wondering if any of you have any. Question right here, yes. Is, where does giving to colleges fit? I think all of the above. A good percentage of with the college, for example, where many of the students come from uh, not necessarily privileged backgrounds and they're preparing for socials. Many of the gifts come from people that are supporting them primarily out of religious motivations. There are other people emotionally, they love their schools, they have spent the best parts of their lives there, or they have gratitude for uh, for 
financial aid that they received there and they're grateful for what they got. Or they're very conservative politically and think the government should not be supporting education and they should do it privately. Or they, they're doing it for social recognition and they want to be the, you know, the class leader and, you know, back in, they want to lead the way for their class. Uh, but again, I think the, that the tax motivations are there for some people, but I would say in education, it's primarily, it's primarily emotionally driven, memories, uh, nostalgia, et cetera. Dr. Bruce. It's often been said that uh, there's a generosity index in, in this part of the country, Arkansas, Mississippi, perhaps Louisiana, Alabama, of uh, individuals giving out of proportion to their income uh, for charitable purposes. Is that true of uh, individuals with a lot of assets? As opposed income persons give smaller amounts, but they give a larger percentage of their money to charity than the wealthy. And that the really, the super wealthy actually give the smallest percentages of their income. Large amounts, but if you look at it as a proportion of their assets and their capability to give, and I think that people have traced that back to the fact that people who are on the lower end of the economic spectrum, they've seen personally, they've seen more need and more friends, family, and people that need help, and they tend to be uh, more generous. Uh, and I think given the fact that in the South and the Delta and the area you're talking about, there's, there's generally lower uh, average incomes. I think that just reflects the fact that, that those people are closer to their communities and maybe seeing more of the needs. Yes, question in the back row. The back row, team. Yes, um, I've uh, looked at a lot of the economics literature over the years on charitable giving, and if we look at charitable giving excluding arts and humanities, we tend to see for any way you want to break down income levels, a fairly flat percentage of giving to things like social services, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, hunger programs. And I think what you said is correct. It's hard for the rich to identify at times with being poor. At the same time, there seems to be what economists call a misattribution bias. That is, that uh, wealth or, or income is tied to effort. And one of the theories is that uh, if you buy into that too much, then you tend to think, well, I deserve everything that I've gained. It's all through my sweat as opposed to good fortune or blessing. And therefore those that earn less than me aren't working as hard, which, you know, I think a ditch digger worked as hard as I ever worked as an economist or harder. They sweated a lot more. Uh, but have you seen that trend that for, for non-arts and humanities giving, right. the average giving as a percent of income is roughly equal across all. You might, it's about 2.4 percent. Right. You may be describing the Ayn Rand index of misanthropy, where uh, people believe that people are poor because they're poor and that their own problems. And um, I've even seen people say that you shouldn't support programs for, to support the poor because all you're doing is encouraging more poor people. So, you know, I, I think you can find all sorts of, but I, I think one thing we do find is it's sort of two schools of, a, a lot of the, the major gifts in this country are not made by people with necessarily old inherited money. It's, a lot of it's entrepreneurial types, the Bill Gates of the world, the Henry Fords, the people who began with humble beginnings and worked very hard and know that a lot of their success was due to their hard work, but they also know that they had some breaks along the way that other people don't get. So I think that there's, uh, also, I'll say something here that, that's a little bit off the beaten path, but I won't name this person, but this is a man who worked for 50 years in, in a major university and worked with several generations of the same families. 
and he worked with the, gra the great grandfather who made this original fortune, who was very generous, very philanthropic man. The next generation, he had three or four children. One of them was generous and the rest of them weren't. Then in the third generation, he, the, the children that were generous were the children of the second generation who weren't. So he believes in a sense that it may be almost a, a talent or a trait, a genetic thing that a certain number of people in society that we distribute talents and a certain number of people have these talents, whether they are, whether they are wealthy or poor. And that might account for the 2.4% across the board because maybe it's just that, that that's just kind of the average that's wired in, into us. So I, I wouldn't base my career on that assumption that you can go out and find people's DNA and find your fundraisers. But, uh. Heather, you got a question right here. Wait, the microphone right here, Jeannie, right here. Put, raise your hand. I was wondering if there's any serious discussion in D.C. about pulling the charitable deduction above the line, and it's not an itemized deduction. It's just a, that's, a flat subtraction for all of us, this, that's the non-itemizers too. That's a really interesting point because that's something that, that we really proposed that about 20-something 20, 20 years ago, but that, that probably is the answer to it. You can have a flat tax and a charitable deduction. What you do is you just say we're going to tax all income at 20% and then you just redefine income as not including money that's, that's voluntarily redistributed. There are other above the line unreimbursed business expenses. Uh, alimony is a good example where you earn the money and you pay the alimony. The alimony is, comes off the top and then it's reported as income by the recipient. So in effect, this is money that's, that, is, that is voluntarily foregone but this then begs the question as to whether the wealthy are really receiving other intangible benefits for their gifts, and it really is benefiting them, like recognition. And that's the argument against that is that it's not really completely foregone. But it would, ha but but I think that moving it above the line would would definitely treat it as a different. It is different than mortgage deduction. It is different than some of the other deductions. It's not a loophole. It's not something, the mortgage interest is designed to encourage home building. I would say that maybe overuse of the, of the interest deduction and allowing people to bloat the house, that might have contributed to the housing bubble. I don't know of any societal ills that have been contributed to by the charitable deduction. Well, let's, uh, let's give Robert a round of applause.